Good morning. Welcome to the Resolution Foundation. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning for our event from treadmills to stairwells, social mobility across advanced economies. And I'm delighted that this is an event that we're hosting in partnership with the OECD. Uh, the OECD brought out just before the summer break their report on social mobility, a broken social elevator. And uh, this is the first event in the UK uh, discussing and investigating the findings of their report. So we're delighted to be working with the OECD on this uh, and talking to Mark, Mark Pearson, who is with us from OECD. Uh, he was observing how OECD are doing more and more work on social mobility. Uh, and it's fascinating to see how the debate is developing. And whilst we in the UK beat up on ourselves on social mobility, and there's certainly a lot more to be done, and we were hearing from Damien Hines, the Secretary of State for Education, about precisely that in this room only a few weeks back, while there is more to be done, there are, as Gavin Kelly here at Resolution has pointed out, there are actually some respects in which, surprisingly, the UK appears to be making progress. And alongside the dark picture, when there are bits of good news, we should draw attention to them. So, for example, it's interesting how, on persistence in low incomes, it does look as if the UK has made significant progress, according to this OECD report, less stickiness, less trapped on very low incomes, uh, both compared with the UK 20 years ago and also compared with some other advanced Western countries. So I hope we're going to have a lively debate on what are the challenges that we face, how we're doing compared with other countries and look at where we're making progress as well as where there's still a lot more to do. You will hear first from Mark Pearson from the OECD who will give us a presentation drawing on the OECD's excellent work. I'm delighted that we're joined by Jonathan Slater, the Permanent Secretary at the Department for Education, which is now the lead department on social mobility, reflecting the interest that Justine Greening and now Damien Hines have in the subject. Uh, we'll then hear from Lindsay McMillan at the Institute of Education, now part of UCL, who's one of our leading economists researching social mobility, and then Lucy Powell, Labour MP and member of the Education Select committee and then it'll be over to you for questions. So Mark, over to you. Brilliant. Well, th thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Resolution Foundation. I mean, it, it is great to be here. I think this is the first event we've done with you. I mean, your, your reputation is definitely growing every year internationally. Uh, so I think some of the work you do is, is absolutely fabulous. Yes, now, this, this is a very strange room, isn't it? I'm not used, it fe really does feel like a cinema. You described it as a cinema, and actually, is that what you do all day? Is that the, <laughs> watch old films? So, uh, as David said, we've been working on social mobility, but it's been a, a process that's led us up to look at social mobility at the OECD. If we go back in time, a lot of our fo focus really was initially going in the, the early 2000s, looking at trying to develop comparable measures of income inequality and trends in inequality. And then over time that's developed. So then in 2011, we published a big report under analyzing the causes of that rise in inequality that we've been documenting. And in 2015, we had another big report looking at the economic and social consequences. So this is, if you like, the fourth in a series of big uh, flagship reports that we've been doing on inequality and this time and now very much our focus is on social mobility. Now the report's a great huge fat thing um, and it covers not just intergenerational but also intragenerational mobility. It looks not just at income mobility but earnings, uh, it looks at educational mobility and health mobility. I don't have a huge amount of time, I'm going to focus very much on intergenerational mobility and mainly on, on income as well. But feel, feel free to ask me more about the other aspects if you want. So let me start with, if you like, the headline figures. We, we're trying to find a way to summarise uh, intergenerational mobility across countries in a readily understandable way. And I think this is the best that we've come up with. It's given the levels of mobility that we see, how long would it take if you're in the bottom 
of the population in terms of income to actually move up to the median level. And you can see in the UK, it's about five generations, 150 years. So that's how long it would take on average. Now, as you can see, actually, the average is 4.5% from the countries that we've managed to look at. It's not that the UK is desperately bad at social mobility. Indeed, if you look at this, you can see the, the appalling figures when you get to some of the emerging economies, the sort of Brazil, South Africa, and Colombia's. Unsurprisingly, the best performers there are the, the Nordic countries, which do have relatively high social mobility. But for example, I think it probably is a surprise to a lot of people to see UK as a higher level of social mobility than, say, France and Germany. Uh, there are reasons for that, which maybe we'll get into a little bit more. Nevertheless, clearly there are some countries doing much better, and I hope that you will learn from them. The obvious question, of course, is the link between social mobility and income inequality. Uh, obviously, higher income inequality is much, much more tolerable, I think everybody would agree, if there is a great deal of mobility in the population. Uh, Miles Korak a while back did this, this curve relating earnings mobility today with inequality in the past. It's often called the Gatsby curve. And this is an updated and extended version of that Gatsby curve. It still exists. There clearly is a relationship. So more inequality um, means lower social mobility. More inequality in the past, lower social mobility today. Um, this is really looking at fathers and sons, I should say. Uh, there are problems which many of you will be aware of if you try and look at daughters and mothers in the data. So the obvious conclusion from this, and we've done a lot more work to document it in a much more statistically valid way, is that higher inequality harms the prospects of moving up the, um, the distribution of incomes, particularly, in fact, through the effects on educational decisions. I mentioned that we had different dimensions of mobility that we're looking at. I've, I've talked a bit already about the income inequality and got a little continuum there that the, uh, the UK is a slightly higher level of inequality in social mobility um, uh, than the OECD average. Actually much worse when you start looking at educational mobility. So educational mobility is quite low internationally speaking uh, when you look at at the, uh, the comparisons there. Uh, I should maybe mention other countries. The northern countries, the Nordic countries, do very well across all the different dimensions of mobility, income, health, whichever you want to look at. The continental European countries are low social mobility on actually a lot of the different measures. And maybe I should say something now. I mean, it, in France and Germany, it is down to the educational systems. The, the French system is very, very inegalitarian in its effects, it sorts people very, very efficiently. And that means it replicates the social um, problems, the social situation of the previous generation in future generations. And as many of you probably know, the early tracking system in Germany, where people are sorted into different streams and different schools, again, tends to entrench that social, um, social immobility at quite an early age. So those are countries that do quite badly. Japan and Korea, it, worth pointing out, because people don't normally think about social mobility very much in those countries when we think about what, what we can learn from them. Very, very high on educational mobility in both German, Japan and Korea. Much less so on income mobility. And it's largely to do with the fact that women find it very difficult in the labour market. And that has a dampening effect on mobility. But they are doing something right, at least in the education system. One of our key messages is this issue of sticky floors and sticky ste ceilings. So the mobility in the middle of the distribution in most countries, it's, there's a certain amount of fluidity. If you're talking about the two ends, people with high income, their children tend to stay near the top of the distribution. And similarly, people at the bottom of the distribution tend to stay towards the bottom. So it's really a story about social mobility is a story of what's happening at the two extremes. And so what we've done here in this chart is looking at how low earnings mobility, um, how, how children of different um, economic backgrounds, whether they can get into the top 
earnings quartile. So if we look at boys in this case from who are the sons of fathers in the top earnings quartile and you look at the UK, it's uh, about 42% of them will end up in the, in the top earnings quartile as well. If you look at the children of fathers in the bottom earnings quartile and how many of them make it to the top earnings quartile, we're talking about 17%. That's a slightly larger gap than the OECD average, as you'd expect. I've already shown that the social mobility is slightly lower in the UK than the, the OECD average. Uh, but you can see there the, the gaps in some countries are much, much wider if you start looking, say, at the United States and Germany, um, both at the bottom and to some extent at the top. You're much more likely to remain, um, your, your children will remain near the bottom and the top in the future. Running out of time very quickly, I just want to start saying something about policy because it's, it's relevant. What, what we've done here in trying to give some idea of international evidence, international insights, what I've done here is to, to look at the educational mobility on the vertical axis and I've plotted it against public expenditure on education in 1995, so going back in time. And you can see a clear relationship there. Uh, again, it's indicative. This isn't proof. This isn't formal causal evidence. But nevertheless, you can see a relationship there that the countries that put more energy into an efficient, uh, into a, an effective education system are seeing greater social mobility pay off 25 years later. Policy choices therefore matter. I actually can do something similar on health as well. It's maybe not quite as strong as the relationship, but nevertheless it's there as well. So I, get, I think it's saying something about, yes, policies can make a difference here. want to just finish, uh, th this, is, this is a general overview of what's going on internationally on social mobility. I'm not pretending to have done an in-depth study on the UK. Nevertheless, from looking at what countries who are trying to improve their social mobility have been focusing on, there are some obvious things to pick up on in the UK. In addition to the education, workforce upskilling, the, the UK's big problem without question economically and socially. The system of non-standard employment, the fact that that can, in the UK in particular, be a trap uh, and doesn't promote more mo earnings mobility, it can promote less and so how we deal with non-standard forms of employment. And of course, the high housing costs, the impact there both on reducing regional mobility but also in entrenching wealth inequalities across populations. Many other things I could say, but I can see from this very annoying clock that's been ticking away in my eye line throughout, I really should stop there. Thanks, thanks David, thanks for your... Thank you very much indeed, Mark, and uh, fascinating. I mean, of course, the three, those three kind of policy conclusions you drew are all areas of great interest to us at Resolution Foundation on which we are doing work, and it's... Uh, and you encourage us to do more on those themes. Well, we're delighted to be joined by Jonathan Slater, Permanent Secretary from the Department for Education. Jonathan, over to you. So I'm going to stand up rather gingerly um, because I did my back in on the way in. And I don't know whether that was a sort of subliminal message to me not to come along today because uh, it was going to be a, a painful affair. I hope not. Um, but anyway, that's why I'm standing. Health warning number two. Since I'm, um, I'm halfway through a five year stint as the head of the department, um, uh, working for Conservative government. Previously, I've worked for Labour and Liberal Democrat politicians for the last 30 years. You don't get to do this sort of work for 30 years if you offer a view as to who's right and who's wrong. Uh, so you won't be getting that from me. I can just explain a little bit about what we're doing at the moment, about how it's changed over the two and a half years that I've been in charge of the department. I hope that's useful to you. Uh, when I arrived um, under a David Cameron-led government, the main effort of the Department for Education was taking schools away from local authority, uh, oversight and turning them into independent charities overseen by, well, me. Uh, uh, that was uh, academization, uh, and that was definitely the department's main effort. Within a few months, um, uh, you know, referendum, a new prime minister, new secretary of state, Justin Greening, the main effort for the department uh, changed uh, to become social mobility. I remember an earlier conversation I had with Justine in which she said, Academists, um, they're not an end to themselves, are they, Jonathan? Uh, but a means to an end. And I thought, hmm, this is going to be interesting. Uh, and it's not, of course, that the department doesn't, hasn't continued to 
academised schools, because it has. And it's not either that the department wasn't promoting uh, policies designed to improve social mobility before, because it was. But nevertheless, this was definitely um, a significant shift in our emphasis. And so what did that mean in practice? It meant for, uh, well, one of the first thing it meant was that um, uh, the Secretary of State wanted to know which of the areas of the country were, uh, were those for which this challenge was its greatest. Um, and so we looked at the data in Hastings, Blackpool and so on. We identified a dozen areas of the country, there were more besides, where this was the greatest problem. And what we um, did then was to speak to the leaders of those communities and say, would you like to work with us on what we could do to improve things? We didn't ask them to bid for resources. We didn't ask them to implement a top-down plan. Um, we asked them if they would like to work with us. And what we were offering was uh, the, the, that we would prioritise our programmes uh, to try and make a particular difference in those areas. And we would put some money in. Um, and what we wanted from them was that they would work collaboratively with us on that challenge. And, w w w when, and, and that's, I think, gone rather well. Um, uh, th these are big entrenched issues, but I think we've been making sort of doing practical stuff in particular areas designed to improve social mobility. Uh, I was having Blackpool recently, how we uh, committing with the schools to reducing the likelihood of working class kids getting excluded from school uh, by a partnership between secondary schools in Blackpool, take a sort of simple practical example. Uh, so that was the first thing we did, and then the second thing we did was to look at our, the work that we were doing and see to what extent we could. Um, we could move it more radically towards um, tackling social mobility and that ended up uh, just before Christmas with the Department of Publishing and Social Mobility Action Plan with a whole range of things in it, which obviously do address questions of lifelong learning, workforce skills, apprenticeships, national retraining service and so on, uh, and all sorts of things too. Then I was lucky enough to get a new Secretary of State. Uh, and, uh, but as, uh, as um, you said, Damien Hines, equally committed to social mobility, um, uh, co-chaired co a all par parliamentary party group on tackling social mobility shortly after becoming an MP. Uh, and so he made very clear to us uh, that he wanted us to crack on with the implementation of this plan that had been published by his predecessor. You don't always get that, uh, but that is what we got. Uh, and so we have cracked on, and hence the speech that he gave uh, that David's just referred to. I've only got a few minutes, so why don't I just give you one example of um, of the work that we're doing and how I was seen a sort of shift over the two and a half years I've been at the Department of Education. So two summers ago, shortly after I'd arrived, what was one of my biggest headaches? Answer, how am I going to get to make sure that all working parents get access to an extra 15 hours free childcare in circumstances where the money that the Treasury has given me is not as much as the nurseries would like to provide the childcare and I've got no means whatever of requiring any of these nurseries to do it if they don't want to. Not straightforward. Uh, and I've worked very hard on that challenge for a year and a half. Uh, and um, well, you know, there have been uh, challenges along the way, but essentially, if you're a working parent, you can get um, an extra 15 hours childcare for free these days. Um, what is the conversation I was having this summer? Because obviously that program wasn't specifically designed to promote social mobility, that was designed to reduce the cost of childcare for working parents. You know, fine, good, you know, no problem with that. Uh, but it's not specifically designed to promote social mobility. What was the conversation, as I say, I was having this summer? It was a conversation with the team about, um, well, why is it that uh, some three-year-olds um, have got a much higher vocabulary than other three-year-olds? And what are the main factors? And if you put aside um, the, the main factor, uh, the mother's um, highest educational standard, the second uh, highest factor is the home learning environment. Um, uh, we, so what can we do about that then? Uh, and then similarly, looking at levels of literacy at entering school, what are the main differences? Uh, what are the causes of, of, of those sorts of differences? Uh, how significant are they? Uh, data suggesting that any sort of preschool provision um, is worth an extra grade in every single GCSE, or is worth uh, seven uh, months worth of education at the age of five. Um, so what could we do then to support better home learning environment for those kids who need it? More high quality childcare for those who particularly need it was the exam question I was being asked this summer. And so the work that uh, Damien referred to here 
recently uh, was work around funding the Education Endowment Foundation to trial some approaches to home learning environment in particular constituencies in the north to see what works. It was putting more money into CPD to improve the quality of um, uh, the, the workforce uh, in particular parts of the country, particularly focused on those areas of the country with the greatest level of disadvantage. It was funding for new school nurseries. Um, it was th these sorts of activities. It was uh, updating the early years curriculum to take account of the most recent evidence about child development and at the same time trying to reduce um, teachers' workloads. Those sorts of activities, um, which are sort of more specifically targeted at tackling that social mobility challenge. Probably time to stop now. Um, so I, I give you some sense of the sorts of things we're doing. We're sort of moving from a sort of from the, the main effort being trying to improve the system as a whole to the main effort being trying to target uh, our resources on those who need them the most. I hope that's useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Now uh, we're going to hear from Lindsay McMillan from Institute of Education. Lindsay. Thanks a lot. I apologise, I'm an academic, so I can't actually do anything without slides. Um, so what I wanted to do was just tie in quite a lot of what Mark's already said with what we know about social mobility here in the UK and go a little bit deeper. Um, if anyone hasn't had a chance to look at the report, I would really advise it. It's really interesting. And there's fantastic amount of stuff in there that I won't be able to talk about, but I just wanted to focus in on a couple of points that really kind of resonated with what we're doing. Um, so just top level summary, uh, we don't look good in terms of earnings mobility, education mobility and income inequality. And as Mark showed you, these things are really closely related. So you can't really have high mobility in countries that have high inequality, <laughs> despite that being, you know, something that people might strive for. Uh, also interestingly is that we don't look so bad in terms of occupational mobility or health mobility. And I think a really important point here is that these things don't have to move in the same way. You can have different mobility across different domains. But what I really wanted to focus in on was the uh, concept of sticky floors and sticky ceilings because that's something that really struck me when I was reading the report and I think it's something that we have a slight issue with here in the UK. Um, so this graph here is from a recent paper uh, where we've been looking at the relationship between parental income and childhood and adult earnings across the distribution of where people end up. So the people to the right of the graph are those that end up as the top earners, the ones working in the top jobs, and the people to the bottom, uh, sorry, to the left of the graph are those that end up at the bottom of the distribution, either out of work or on really low low pay. And what you can see is that there's this kind of J-shaped curve going on. So the relationship between parental income and your adult earnings is particularly strong for those who end up either at the bottom and more particularly at the top in the UK. Now you can look at the role of education in this. You can condition on early skills, uh, GCSE attainment, A-level attainment, what university people go to, what subjects they study at university. And that can account for more or less about half of what's going in on, particularly at the top, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, so we just heard from Jonathan all the stuff that Department for Education are doing with regards to this. I want to focus a little bit more here on the fact that there's a story beyond education as well in the labour market that is also important. If you condition on early labour market attachment, you see for those that end up at the bottom, this is a particularly important story. So these people ending up at the bottom, it's that kind of more chaotic school-to-work transition experience that people from more deprived backgrounds get that is particularly pronouncing that relationship between parental income and childhood and adult outcomes. So I'm going to focus just for the next couple of minutes on what happens at the top and then I'm going to come back to what's happening at the bottom in more detail. So this idea of sticky ceilings, what's going on? Well, we know that access to top jobs is highly socially graded, particularly for doctors, learn, uh, journalists, lawyers, even academics, which I'm ashamed to say. Um, if you come from a working class background, you're far less likely to enter into these occupations than if you come from a professional background. This is from a report we wrote last year for the Social Mobility Commission. 
But there's also an issue with progression within top jobs. So even if you're from a working class background and you get into one of these top professional jobs, you're still likely to get paid less than an individual who's come from a professional family working in the same top job. The clicker stopped working. Oh, there you go. What's happening at the bottom? Now, the story at the bottom is uh, one of um, persistence in those individuals who are cycling in and out of work. So we have a fairly strong association between jobless spells. In, uh, people who experience parents with jobless spells um, spells in childhood and people who end up having jobless spells in adulthood. I want to be really clear here, this isn't a story of never working families. This is a story of families who are constantly experiencing this kind of low pay, no pay cycle. And this is particularly pronounced in bad labour markets. So when work disappears, people from disadvantaged families are the first to lose those jobs, the first to be impacted by these kind of workless experiences. So Ireland is doing particularly badly here, but Belgium and Italy are the only ones who have a higher intergenerational jobless association than we do in the UK. Importantly, this also isn't a story of this culture of dependency argument that you might sometimes hear. In countries that have more generous welfare systems, this intergenerational jobless association is much lower. This isn't a causal argument, but the OECD report makes this point really well, and I thank Mark for that. Money matters. Money matters for protecting those at the bottom from these kind of job shocks. So I've probably spoken for almost the full amount of time. This is the final slide, and I just wanted to pull out this line, which I thought was particularly interesting from the report. The main challenge is to ensure opportunities for upward mobility for talented people at the bottom, while at the same time preventing those from the top end from preempting advancement. Now, the issue with high income inequality, which we do have in this country, is that it raises the stakes. And so, preventing the top end from preempting advancement when the stakes are high becomes an ever more challenging task. And that is why income inequality and income mobility are so inextricably linked. Um, Jonathan talked a lot about education, so th the bottom points here were about um, policy options. I'll just focus on the last two with relation to sticky ceilings and sticky floors. As I said, we've got a slight issue in terms of access to and progression within jobs in this country. Uh, the Social Mobility Foundation are doing a lot of fantastic work in this area, as are the Sutton Trust. Uh, providing networks for those who don't have them, linking them to top jobs, but there's a lot more that we can do. Um, building stronger information channels and also understanding, allowing individuals from lower SES families to understand better what it is that firms are looking for is a particularly important thing. And for easing sticky floors, for this kind of intergenerational cycle that's happening for those at the bottom, money matters. Investing in education also matters. So Mark did show a graph about investment in education. The same thing is also true for intergenerational joblessness and for earnings mobility, as Joe Bland and one of my colleagues has shown. Okay. Poor, poor John. It's heroic that you're here with these suffering like this, Donald. Uh, Lucy, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, I'll. If this microphone works, yes, it does. Yeah. Marvelous. I'll I'll just stay sitting here. Why not? Because it's quite a long way over there. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Thanks to the Resolution Foundation and thanks for the fantastic report that the OECD have done. I think your work is always incredibly seminal and uh, very influential over here in in the UK. So hopefully this report can also add uh, to that conversation we're having here about social mobility, which I think is. Uh, growing, as we've heard from the, from the DfE as well. Um, I just want to say a, a few things in, in response. Um, the first thing is about how we conceive of social mobility, and I've written about this a few times before. I actually think it's a bit unhelpful, and I think politicians in particular um, often do this, to, to think about um, social mobility simply as uh, plucking the lucky few from the bottom and taking them all the way to the top. So the sort of council estate to the cabinet table kind of story. Um, we probably don't do that badly on that actually in this country. Um, but that's really not the, so the social mobility 
credibility argument that we are trying to advance here. So I take your metaphor of elevators and I think of it more in terms of escalators um, or perhaps a, an upward trajectory conveyor belt um, that allows people to hop on and hop off uh, throughout their lives and is particularly focused on, on those first few um, steps, getting people off the sticky floor. Uh, but, but showing that real economic and social advancement throughout someone's uh, throughout someone's life, and not just uh, plucking that uh, lucky few. Um, as we've heard, there are many many different um, uh, issues that uh, create these sticky floors and sticky ceilings. From housing, in particular, I think is a is a really key issue. Uh, networks. Uh, and of course education and I'm just going to focus some of my comments on some of the education because uh, I sit on the education select committee former sort of education um, shadow education secretary and social mobility and education is my personal passion which I think is why I was asked to speak uh, here today um, so we've heard a little bit about the importance of the early years and Jonathan was saying about how that story and that conversation in the DfE is changing which I'm really pleased about because this time Last year, uh, I wrote a, a pamphlet about how, in the early years in particular, social mobility was set to go backwards in this country. Because, as Jonathan was saying, the um, focus on childcare for working families, albeit a good thing in, in of itself, the relentless focus on that, I think, uh, by the government, and you could, you could argue the Labour Party as well, has got the potential to exacerbate some of the issues that we've talked about today. So, for example, of the extra money that's going into the early years, uh, six billion over the course of this parliament is a huge amount of money. Three quarters of that uh, extra investment will go on the top earners. The top 50% of earners. So, and we're already hearing anecdotal evidence on the ground about how much more advancement uh, those that are in receipt, those working families that are in receipt of that extra 15 hours, are making in the early years. And as Jonathan's already said, the early years are absolutely critical. By the age of three, a better off uh, child from a better off background will have heard 30 million more words than a disadvantaged child. The single biggest indicator of how well you will do at your GCSEs is your development uh, at the age of five. So we really do have to get uh, the early years right. And, and my message consistently to government uh, and the DfE, uh, I think I'm sort of slightly their bet noir on these things, is we, you, we have to move away from this initiative-itis approach to social mobility. We have to look at it in the round. And quality in the early years uh, around speech and language and communication and quality early education is absolutely uh, critical. So that school readiness agenda, and I think we've got to look at that in terms of places uh, as a place-based model. And I, I am really pleased that the, the DfE are, um, are coming round to that point of view as well, because it's only when we work in a place, bringing together all the agencies and all of those uh, that can support families, will we really uh, start to get some of that right. I just want to say a couple of other things as well. Firstly, about the direction of travel of our education system at the moment. The new GCSEs, uh, the approach of a very academic, knowledge-based uh, curriculum that we are now seeing in this country, is that a good thing or a bad thing for social mobility? I would argue it's a bad thing, let's see, but it's a big experiment we're taking. We're going in the opposite direction of a lot of the countries we just saw at the top of all the graphs from the OECD and uh, at earlier. We're going in the opposite direction. Instead of acquiring skills, which you can then use throughout your life, we are focusing education very much on uh, the regurgitation of knowledge. Um, and uh, is that a good or a, or a bad thing? I would say a bad thing. Um, I think uh, this issue around transitioning to work is absolutely key, this work readiness uh, issue. And I think there have been some good developments in, the, in recent years on this around apprenticeships, you know, ra raising the um, status of apprenticeships, I think is absolutely uh, critical. And also, I think the new T levels, the new technical uh, levels have got the ability to deliver that as well. But again, let's not get myopic and focus in just on delivering that particular policy to the exclusion of all else. We have to remember that people, young people and their parents are real people living in a real world, making decisions about their future. And uh, I think sometimes we lose that at our, um, at our peril. 
Um, so it is about, I think, I would, what I would like to see is a much stronger focus on pathways, on that conveyor belt, on that escalator approach that is not siloed. I recently, uh, we, I was recently challenging the early years minister on this in, in the Education Select Committee, and he was talking about the baseline assessments and so on. And he said, well, we need those because we need to judge the schools on how well someone's doing from the age of five to the age of 11. And my response was, well, I'm not actually that interested in the schools and how they're doing from that point. I'm interested in a child from the age of naught to 25 and what their journey is throughout that whole time and what progression they're making. And we still too much operating in these very siloed approaches that don't actually join up. So um, finally, just to sort of say on access to the professions, I think that is uh, absolutely uh, critical. The sticky ceilings point really stuck with me. The advantages of wealth, not just of wealth, but of secure housing, of capital uh, in housing, and the social networks that they bring is really one of the drivers to that uh, sticky ceilings. And we've got to um, unlock that in a way that I just don't think we've ever tried to do before. So I just wanted to end on a, on an, a recent anecdote. Um, I met this young lad uh, just this week actually, uh, whose dad is a labourer, very much a labourer, he's not even a brickie, uh, he hasn't got the skills to be a brickie, he's a labourer, uh, got a good work ethic, his mum's unemployed, uh, his mum and dad split up, he lives with his dad and uh, th he's a white lad from the north, from Manchester and he uh, just got his A-Love results a couple of weeks ago, he got two A-stars and an A in maths, further maths and physics and on Saturday he's going to Cambridge which is absolutely uh, marvellous. And he's benefited from many of the programmes that people talked about here. But I pose the question, will he go on to earn the same as his peers? Uh, he will probably go on to earn less than many of his peers at Cambridge. And as I keep trying to say to him, don't let that happen because the fact that you've got the journey and the backstory you've got makes you better than most of the people that are also at Cambridge, not worse. But his life probably won't be quite as advantageous as the rest of his colleagues. And just following up on Lucy's last point, um, we put a lot of effort into trying to broaden access to university through offer, uh, and that had a very substantial spend, about a thousand pounds of the nine thousand pound student fees goes on this. But we were so preoccupied with who we were getting into university that it was very shocking when the evidence came out that for any given level of attainment at university, when you then went on out into the jobs market, People from more disadvantaged backgrounds then performed less well. And when I, as a minister for university, used to discuss this with Les Ebden, one of the problems was that the legal framework for the access spend was very clear. It was to get people in. And one of the things that has happened in the new legislation is that the legal framework for offer has been broadened. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, it's, you can ask universities to spend some of this money on investing in the students after they've arrived to help give them better prospects in the jobs market after, you know, sort of subsidising an internship during the summer vacation or whatever, because it's absolutely right. And I think one of the themes from the discussion we've already had is that social mobility comes at every stage of the life cycle. There is no magic, magic bullet at some one moment where you say, we've cracked it, you've got to, you've got to intervene consistently across the life cycle. Good. Now, over to you guys. Let's collect. I'm going to collect two or three interventions. We've got a roving mic. Let's start with two people here in the middle. George, that's right. Hi there. This is Oliver Cardinale, former social mobility advisor to Justine, and now working on the industrial strategy team in Bayes. Um, we're looking to, basically, one of the things we're looking into is how we mitigate against that thing that Lindsay identified as job shock. What would be the two or three recommendations you would make to us as policy officials and what we can do to protect that, specifically in a labour market, not in education policy? So we know it takes 150 years to go from the bottom 10% to the median, but the size of the bottom 10% isn't shrinking. So from the point of view of policy intervention, we need to know how many generations it takes from the median down to the bottom 10%. Because only then will we understand the dynamics of the system that locks so many people into the bottom. 
Right. Thank you. And uh, yes, at the back there. Yeah. Uh, Tom Schuller, former OECD staffer, a long time ago now. Hello, Mark. Uh, I look forward to reading the OECD report, and in particular, interested in see how you handle the gender issue, given that women outperform men so substantially in every OECD country. But my question is a policy question to all the panel, and that is about, would you not agree uh, that if we want to make a better link between education and social mobility, a major rebalancing of post-school education in favour of further education is absolutely essential. And just as a little rider to Jonathan on creating a home environment, uh, if you want to help kids through their parents, adult learning is uh, a very important route to that, and that is most likely to happen through FE colleges and like similar institutions. Mark, do you want to comment first on all three questions? V very good. Um, the, the, the easiest one to answer is this issue about looking at both the upward and the downward mobility. I mean, that, that showing the five generations is just a way to try and summarise an exceptionally complicated set of information. We could do something in reverse as well. The data is all there. Obviously, it's all about the different elasticities elasticities in different places. So the, my point there is not to particularly make a big issue about five generations. It's just to try and put some almost human way of actually thinking about our issues of, of mobility there. But you're right, of course, if you're talking about people moving down uh, up in the relative income uh, distribution, then obviously there must be some people who are moving down in the distribution as well and understanding why they are and whether that is something we should be worried about from a policy point of view is indeed uh, very important. But let, let me leave that there. Tom, hi, good to see you, good to see you again. It must be 20 years or <laughs> so since, since I last saw you. He's been very busy since then producing excellent reports. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I, I think you know, one of the things that comes out when, when you do these international comparisons is very easy to start talking about policies in a very abstract way about, yes, we need more adult learning or we need more vocational training and so on. In practice, it's very difficult to do this unless you have institutions in place. And I think one of the assets that the UK has always failed to exploit has been these institutes the, of higher education and further education that had were in place, have been really quite neglected over many years. And yet you've known, everybody in this room knows that we've had an issue about poor skills in the adult population and we've never really exploited that in the way that I think some other countries have been much more effective when you start going to the Nordic countries, for example, and, and how closely they've managed to link in with the employers and with the jobs market. Uh, so I think that's uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Tom. Um, thanks very much for that. The job shock issue. Um, Obviously, that's much more ex extreme in many respects in the UK than elsewhere because of the nature of our social welfare system, which tends to provide a very, very low level of income and only to those who don't have other assets, uh, who don't have assets. So that means that a lot of what we find is that people actually fall quite sharply in the income distribution when you have um, a loss of a job. In some respects, the UK has a great advantage, which is that the labour market is such that people do find jobs quite quickly. And when we do these analyses, we do find that people get back into employment quite quickly in the UK compared with other countries, but they don't get back at the same level of earnings. So basically what we're doing is that when people lose their jobs, because we don't have a welfare system in the same way as many other countries, people accept jobs with lower levels of income thereafter, which probably puts them on a different trajectory for the rest of their, mm -hmm. their career. And I think that is a genuine problem and a genuine issue, which I don't quite understand why there's not more debate in the UK mm -hmm. about whether actually it would be worth thinking about a slightly higher level of income support, not for the normal reasons of making sure that people have a higher standard of living when they're without jobs, but for the issue of job matching, to make sure that we actually do get people to match the jobs that they're doing with the skills that they have, because the UK doesn't do that particularly well. Yeah. Okay. So, and while you're talking, Mark, can I just press you on this post-16 kind of non-HE route? Because one of the paradoxes which comes out in your work is that 
almost every event we have here on skills and non-HE routes, people say, we've all got to learn from Germany, it's fantastic, we need the German model, we need German apprenticeships. And then every social mobility presentation I see, Germany doesn't score very highly. Germany, and it, and it may be the case that the model they've got of vocational training is actually not one that, that promotes social mobility. Have you got any advice for us on that? I completely agree. And the, the issue there, though, I would say much more is that when the streaming comes, the streaming in Germany comes very, very early on. So from around about the age of 11, there is virtually no chance of you, if you've been put in, in what will eventually lead to vocational track, for you to actually get across into the academic track. So it's happened very, very early on. Now, suppose you don't want to be in the, um, the academic track, even though you are in the academic track, you'd rather move into the vocational training. The pressures on you to remain in the academic track are intense in Germany. You are not going to switch out. And so there's, there's two things. It's like the technical efficiency and the allocative efficiency. In fact, I do think the apprenticeship system in Germany is fantastic for those who should be doing apprenticeships. The trouble is they've ended up with a lot of people who shouldn't be doing the apprenticeships doing the apprenticeships. And some people who should be aren't, they're in the academic. And that's why you have this paradox of both a really quite good system that we should learn from, and yet at the same time, we close, uh, Germany itself is closed off a route to social mobility. Right, thank you, very interesting. Lindsay. Just to add to the point, oh, I don't think I'm on anymore. If, if don't, anyway. worry, don't worry, it'll catch up with you. Just to add to the point about the uh, tracking from an early age, I might just have to make the point again that grammar schools do that as well here, and so mm. pushing the grammar school mm. agenda, which seems to have somehow gone down the list of important things that we're doing, but, but it is the same story. If you sort people at age 11, you're going to end up with these kind of issues in terms of social mobility, and despite some of the discussions that you might have heard in the press, all of the academic evidence, at least regarding grammar schools, is that they fundamentally do not aid social mobility. Um, uh, where to start? I think with regards to, I'm, I'm going to go backwards, so with regards to a rebalancing of education, there was a great Resolution Foundation blog actually yesterday which pointed out, much along the same lines as what you were saying, that we're fascinated, we're obsessed with HE in this country, but over half the population do not go to HE. And actually the variation in outcomes and what people end up doing for those that don't go to HE is very, very wide. Um, I think the quality of provision um, for, for non-HE is something which people have been working on. It's yet to be seen what's going to happen with regards to T-levels um, and apprenticeships indeed, but the IFS report earlier this week raised some serious questions in this area, the funding crisis for 16 to 18 year olds is terrifying and in a sector which is already facing <laughs> constant reform, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. Um, but quality is key, right? You need to get people from high SES backgrounds buying into these type of qualifications if it's going to translate into social mobility because as your point already emphasised with regards to people moving down, that's the point that people never think about. People need to be moving down for people to move up. Job shocks, uh, I think Mark answered that question really well already, but it's, it's again about the quality of employment. So here's an interesting you know, change to the conversation that's been happening, I think, over the last 10 years. What if we actually increased benefits and allowed people that chance to achieve a better match in terms of job quality instead of talking so much about the way that people use benefits to just stay at home. Giving people the opportunity to find time to match properly into quality employment. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. Yep, very helpful. <laughs> Lucy? Um, thanks, yeah, well I'll just keep my uh, response to kind of one of the issues, uh, which was really what Tom raised about further education and adult learning, um, absolutely spot on. And I think as we've seen from the OECD report today, you know, money really does talk in this area and we have some of the lowest levels of post-16 uh, funding uh, in the OECD um, and uh, that's going down and down uh, every day that we that we speak and uh, adult learning has virtually disappeared completely and
and I think that that ties in with that job shock point as well if you're somebody who's recently lost work and obviously with automation and the rise of the robots and all of that that's going to be a bigger issue uh, potentially coming down the track we've got to have a much more robust system of retrain retraining adults i think the apprenticeship levy is an opportunity in this area and in fact you know there's been some criticism of has the apprenticeship levy been being used too much to provide CPD effectively or, or um, training for those who are already in work. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, I think that's that's uh, that's not a bad use as long as it's sort of showing that that progression there as well. Um, I think, though, just building on from what's just been said, I think in terms of this parity of esteem point and uh, further education and higher education, we've got to do a lot more about the advice that young people uh, get because let's be honest, most teachers obviously just by their nature have been to university, that's the path that they've done and it's not their job to give careers advice which has virtually sort of disappeared from, from the, um, the, the horizon altogether. and young people just aren't getting good advice about where their future lies. And I would say that that applies also to those going into HE. I think um, we just don't have a focus enough in this country about those pathways that I was talking about um, earlier. And that's why we've got one of the highest levels of graduate um, employment in non-graduate jobs. Uh, I think, it was, again, it's an OECD report. I think only Estonia and Greece uh, have higher levels of graduates working in non-graduate jobs. So obviously if graduates are not working in a graduate job and they're working in jobs that other people should be pushing everybody uh, else down, because the truth is, you know, I, I say this to my own kids all the time, you know, there's no point going to a mediocre university to sort of do a mediocre humanities degree, quite honestly. Um, you know, you're better off doing a, a degree apprenticeship in engineering or something else, which are highly competitive actually, um, and get paid for it. You don't get the fees. And, and you, so we, we do need to have a different conversation about what is a good thing for people to choose to do. And until we do that, I don't think we'll get some of it right. And so just a final point on this issue about, it's interesting what you're saying about Germany, about this point of selection. This is my one uh, main concern about the new T levels, technical, um, a levels that are coming in is that we are asking at 16 for young people to choose either a technical route or or an academic route when actually most of the jobs of the future in healthcare in education in engineering in computing and all of those things most of those jobs of the future require a blend of the academic and the technical and i think we uh, we ask people to choose too early at our peril whatever early is whether it's 11 16 or, or, or later. I agree with you on early choosing, but I'm sure those jobs will also depend on some of the skills you learn by studying the humanities. If well, no, you I couldn't restrain I, myself. I, on cute, that. Sorry, I mean, I don't just mean human. I mean, even any any subject. Whatever. They, they don't have pathways necessarily. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Um, now, let's hear from the firm. And if I may, can you? Would you like also briefly, Jonathan, to, as adult skills of have uh, been referred to. Of course, the Chancellor did announce some extra spending for adult retraining, and I think there's now the CBI TUC exercise, and that'd be fascinating sure. to know if you can give us any update on how that's going. Yes, that was, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, well, clearly, obviously, in, in you know, 2010, the government um, prioritised some areas of public spending uh, 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 as it um, put together its overall fiscal strategy, and uh, schools. Um, and because of the fee system, universities did better than other aspects of the education system. And, um, and s s the question for me, building on what Lucy was just saying, is given the, the, the work I've been asked to do on apprenticeships and on T-levels, and the phrase is the National Retraining Service, the NRS, um, uh, are these opportunities, to what extent are these opportunities mm. to help FE um, you know, get back in the game? And they are all opportunities, yeah, yeah. as you say. And the question, but they won't. It won't happen just of its own. It won't happen on its own. They'll need our help. And I was doing a meeting with the Secretary of State and the, and the Minister uh, for Skills a week or so ago, precisely on that question: how we can work together with FE to enable them to take the benefits of you know, there's an extra billion pounds a year if we get this right, going into apprenticeships. So there's some opportunities. Um, uh, what is the balance going to be between the extent to which FE gets their work and the independent training providers? 
uh, and how can we make sure that FE is as well equipped as possible to take those benefits? I wish I'd heard you on the subject of CPD when I was being challenged by Caroline Flint to the PAC. But anyway, the, um, uh, I'll know next time. Uh, so that's an opportunity, which it seems to me FE and uh, with our support need to grab. T-Levels provides an opportunity, clearly. Uh, there's a lot of money going into T-Levels. FE colleges are obviously the, where you would expect that provision to be centred. So how can, we, uh, provide, how can we use that as an opportunity to make sure that FE really uh, benefits from that? And then in the adult education space, absolutely. So the Chancellor is really committed mm. to this notion of a national retraining service and puts uh, additional funding in. How can we make sure that FE is at the heart of that? We've been doing some, actually, since you asked, we've been doing some really rather interesting research on this subject recently because, you know, there are plenty of examples of governments with in initiatives designed to sort out adult education, individual learner accounts comes to mind. Mm. I don't want one of those. What can we do that definitely works? And so we've been, you know, so I was looking at some research from the States about looking at um, uh, people whose, whose jobs fell away from underneath them uh, as they were changing the economy. Uh, and some interesting research that compared those people who were just trying to find another job versus those people who were on a training course and who did better, answer, the ones who just look for another job, interestingly, uh, which doesn't mean I'm out of work. It means I need to design an appropriate system. And the system that we're trying to pilot at the moment is one in which what we're doing is where people are at risk of losing work and need retraining, um, can we organise something that brings together education and the labour market rather than sees them as something distinct? What about a guaranteed interview for somebody who has, is about to lose their job if they do a training course, uh, and we're designing with the employers what actual training the, the employers actually want from the state, um, which is more to do with English, maths, digital, certainly, uh, you know, work, workability skills, but not actually the specific skills required to do the specific job. Why wouldn't that be a matter for the employer themselves? So this is early research, but we're, what we're trying to do is design this based on what we know uh, has worked elsewhere, or more importantly, what hasn't worked. And as I say, this obviously just provides some opportunities for further education who obviously haven't had as much uh, resource as other parts of the education system in the last few years. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, we have really now run out of time, so I do apologise. There's not going to be time for another set of questions. I think we should end just by offering a final opportunity to Mark if you have any further reflections and tell us where the OECD is going next on this and what you're most interested in in the UK debate. OK, well, it, it was a fantastic debate. It was pretty much picking up the issues that I expected to see being picked up. Uh, maybe when I've done some of these talks elsewhere in other countries, it's been even more focused on the future of work and what that will mean for, for, for social mobility. The honest answer being, of course, we don't know, but we suspect it won't be anything good for social mobility, which is uh, rather unfortunate. In terms of what we will be doing, what we need to get down to now is to looking more at what countries are actually doing in to actually look at uh, improved social mobility as opposed to just looking at inequality and so we'll be doing a series of country reviews we'll be going to Austria uh, fairly shortly to start looking at what they're doing and it will be going through other uh, countries we hope at some point to be able to include the UK in that and later on uh, I was going to say this year actually no it's next year I'm um, in a different slightly different cycle we'll be producing another report which is almost a counterpart to this one which focuses particularly on the middle income groups uh, who do move up and down an awful lot but and I, I do clearly for social mobility this issue of sticky floors and sticky ceilings points you to look at both extremes but we all know that of course policy often really is based about what matters for the middle and we know that the middle class middle income groups are feeling under pressure in very many of our countries and understanding why, whether it's more to do with the uh, consumption possibilities, the declining public services and how that will fit in with also this greater focus on the bottom in order to, uh, in order to promote greater social mobility is going to be a very tricky problem, I think, for very many of our countries uh, going forward. Very good. Thank, thank you, Mark. Great to work with OECD on this. Hope we can carry on collaborating in the future. Thank you to 
all of our panellists. I have to say a particular thank you to Jonathan, who clearly is in some personal discomfort. He's gone through the pain barrier to come here, which shows how much the DFE is committed to working on such mobility. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>